Hey traders, Ragi here. Happy Monday, everybody. Welcome to Charts and Coffee for the 12th. Uh, looking, looking really forward to uh, seeing those of you for day four for our day trading playbook live trading immediately following Charts and Coffee. So stoked about that. And um, I will see you all in the futures and options room for the close. So uh, bring it. We're going to go through a lot of symbols together. That'll be at 3 p.m. Uh, today, the last hour of the trading day. And let's see. Housekeeping wise, let's take a quick peek before we jump into the questions uh, as to what's going on with the calendar this week, because this is going to be a big part of those volatility events that we need to keep an eye on right off the bat in 28 minutes we have FOMC member Williams second to Kapowell speaking so that's going to be with the bell should make for an interesting clearing range we'll keep an eye on that together in the live trading here in just a bit and then after that it's pretty quiet we have the 10-year bond auction do be aware of that at just after one uh, we know that the bond uh, yield has been steadily dropping that means real yields should be steadily dropping. We have a nice long position in bonds via the TLT in the sector secrets mastery, looking to build a long gold position as long as real yields are dropping, but we'll probably need a little bit of help from the greenback before we get there. So make sure you're taking a quick look at the calendar. Now, do I think it's kind of interesting that Williams is speaking the day before we get CPI num information. And then a few hours later, we've got Bostic. We've got some Fed members sort of bookending a pretty important inflation number. And as if Bostic speaking once wasn't enough, Bostic times two is what we've got tomorrow. So heads up, all right, heads up, just to kick off this week, uh, we've got, and this is, this is the options expiration week, as if it, it wasn't already exciting enough. It's these excuse me. Woo. All right. <laughs> um, so as if this week wasn't exciting enough, as we go from the pit bull low uh, from last week into options expiration this week. So keep an eye on that PPI numbers coming out. And then we've got Fed Powell on Wednesday. So the first three days of the week, Fed, Fed, Fed event, Thursday, Fed event, and then Friday, car retail sales and retail sales. Yahtzee, this is going to be an interesting week, okay? So my short-term traders, be aware of these particular times. Have them written down on your daily journal and uh, do write them down. Do write them down. There's something about writing that does, I don't know if it's that kinesthetic thing of writing, seeing, um, you will remember it a little bit better. And uh, also for those of you looking at longer-term trend-following swing opportunities, this could be a very interesting week to uh, fade some of that volatility and take advantage of those fully stacked exponential moving average formations. You know it, the double greens. OK, so as always, great to see everybody. Let's get into our uh, Q&A. All right. So kicking this off with what is my take on the XL? F with earnings starting soon. You know, if you would have asked me this right up until, yeah, right up until basically the 16th of June. So about a month ago, if you would have asked me right up to 16th of June, I would, I would have told you, gosh, um, very excited, double green, good chance to see uh, a, a run, the rally, the strength into earnings, <clears throat> done. Why? The structure of this market is essentially uh, broken and makes me sad because this could have been a really good opportunity. And now, could there be some individual names within the XLF that are still with good bullish structure? You know, this is a choppy market, so please don't short it. We just have to wait for oversold levels of support like this in a yellow environment to, to buy. So it's not a trend follow anymore, but it is an oversold buy environment. But generally speaking, uh, Larry, no. Uh, could there be some individual names? Uh, American Express has been on that list. Um, BLK has been on that list. 
BlackRock, and um, Schwab has been on that list, but Schwab's broken. So got to take it really more at an individual stock level as far as relative outperformance into earnings. Thanks for the question. All right, next up, what shenanigans do we have this week in the markets? Michael, review that. Thanks for the question. So keep an eye on all those Fed events that are just peppered throughout the whole darn week, culminating with the uh, retail sales. And you can see here, core retail, retail sales. But golly, we have something to deal with from the Federal Reserve every day this week. Williams, Bostic, Bostic, Kapowell, Kapowell. And that takes us to Friday. So heads up, lots of caution days. So just be just be ready for the potential for volatility. Hey, right, good morning, Win. Uh, let's see. I, of course, my my uh, <laughs> my pleasure. And thanks for making time out in your morning to join us here for charts and coffee. And today we're doing uh, doing an extra mile light roast here. It is really nice for the second cup of coffee. <laughs> All right. Uh, I've learned a lot from you. I appreciate that, Win. I thank you very, very much. It's super kind of you. Um, William, I have three signals, but the bottom row of the multi is red. Um, is that still an okay entry? If the bottom row is red and you want to be a buyer, no. No, unless it's some sort of significant uh, lowest point of the year. and You've got a one, two, three forming, which really ideally should be yellow. So not knowing the symbol you're looking at, William, and not knowing the setup, I would just sort of generally say no. Okay, my friend? All right, so uh, next up, we've got, yes, I agree. Uh, CPI is gonna be critical. Again, interesting that we've got so many Fed members bookending that event, no doubt. No doubt. Um, any thoughts on the cybersecurity VRNS stock? All right. So VRNS, uh, this is part of CIBR, is it not? So I've been look, keeping an eye on CIBR. And let me show you what I do. So here, let's jump into this. I'm going to open up CIBR. Okay, we'll double check the uh, holdings. It, it starts off with CrowdStrike, Zscaler. Um, I, I don't remember the names off, but I think this is looking about right. Cisco, ACN. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so what I'm doing is pulling up CIBR. This is your uh, NASDAQ cybersecurity ETF. And then the top 11 names... Uh, in order of weighting within this within this ETF. And so this gives me a good idea of what is in this list. Now, VRNS is about 3.5%. You can see down here, coming in at the seventh spot, uh, VRNS. So the question is, do we like most of the stocks in this group? Yes, right? Uh, number two is VRNS, uh, you know, moving with the tide. CRBR, yes. And is there anything else that looks better than VRNS? And I'd say they look all about, so what would be better? Uh, better would be proximity to an entry. Better would be, uh, you know, superior structure. Better would be, uh, you know, propulsion dots and consistent green grab candles, uh, double green, which this one is. So, uh, yes, on BRNS, we need a pullback, but I could say the same for basically every stock in the top 11 of CIBR, including CIBR. Uh, I could say that for every stock except for Cisco and except for CyberArk. So yes, on BRNS, and um, I like I like the group. I mean, you ideally want to see so. Let's differentiate two concepts that we're probably going to see. We always we see this almost every summer, but especially when concern about longer term follow through on the broader sectors or the broader indices becomes wishy washy. So the idea is this: um, there's two really two kinds of groups of stocks out there. 
ones that are attached to an index or sector ETF by way of weighting. So that's the boat tides, high concentration weighting influence that quite frankly dominates these markets. The Dow, the NASDAQ, the S&P, all three of those are high concentration weighted indices. Gang, the broader markets go up and down based on about 20 stocks, quite frankly, really on about seven, because those seven stocks are so disproportionately weighted within the averages, they dictate what the market does. About six names in the S&P control about 20 plus percent of the S&P 500. So you might say, well, what does that relegate the other 494 stocks to? Fairy dust, right? Sprinkling. They're seasoning, right? That's what that's what the markets have become. They've been dominated by high concentration weighting. And if people ask me, Rob, do you use market internals? That is why I do not. I don't care about what all stocks are doing because all stocks, quite frankly, are not important. And the sooner you understand the high concentration weighting effect, all of a sudden you realize, oh, for traders, that's actually pretty powerful once you understand that connection. Okay, why am I bringing that up here? Because understanding um, that there are a group of stocks that are connected to the high concentration weighting psychology. And then there are a few stocks that are not heavily weighted within an index and are not heavily weighted within a sector. And those specific stocks have the ability to do their own thing. We have, we have a name for that. We've nicknamed those kinds of stocks. The few stocks that are not part of the high concentration weighting and also Additionally, two factors here are relative outperformance. So if you have a stock that is not a high concentration weighted stock within the indices and the sectors and is a double green, you've got a honey badger. And that's the two groups. You know, you should have a honey badger list. You should have a high concentration weighted list. And you'll understand better why they can do different things. And so BRNS and that whole, this is not going to be a stock that I would separate from the broader conversation. Although I will say um, this is a relatively low volume traded uh, ETF. It's under a million shares of volume. So I would say some of the stocks in here, Cisco, no way, but some of the stocks in here could take on a slightly, um, slightly honey badger-esque. They could, they could move separate from some of the broader averages. So just keep that in mind as we go through sort of the real doldrums of summer between here and mid July to about the end of August. All right. Okay. Next up is AMZN. Sure. Let's take a look at Amazon. You got it. All right. And, and by the way, before I get too carried away, um, I, we got a brand new update as of last Friday, uh, Trish got, and I'm really excited about this particular um, update here, why the daily time frame should be part of your routine, not only as a day trader, but as clearly as a trader of daily time frames. but it really is a check out the update. I'm super excited. This was a topic that she wanted to dive into. So we, we planned this one out to be really a great um, sort of uh, follow up to the day trading class that I'm completing as of today. And also, you know, what we're doing in the mastery, which is you know, a little bit of intraday and a, a little bit of end of day, really bridging the two parts of my trading life. So Amazon, where does this fall in with that earlier uh, conversation, Rajal, regarding high concentration weighting? QQQ, high concentration, Amazon, and the XLY. XLY, this is the ETF that Amazon and Tesla are the two strongest uh, heaviest weighted stocks within. So do I like AMZN? So it's double green, right? So that's the first pass. So it, it passes that, you know, this is what we call that fully stacked EMA, 8, 13, 21 over 34. Separate out the 34 from the 8, 13, 21. Now you'll have a sentiment and momentum indicator and then a trend indicator. That's how we built the JT Multi to really... Um, take a look at the market in probably the best way you can to understand the structure of bullish markets, bearish markets, and choppy markets. You have to, you have to separate those shorter-term exponentials from the longer. 
Uh, that being said, it's viable, but that's the first pass. The second pass is, is it viable from where it sits now? And I would have to say that's a no. I will not buy any stock, any futures contract, any ETF uh, in, a, in the context of a trend near the highs. So let me say that again. I personally will never buy any stock, futures contract, or ETF in the context of a double green market, fully stacked, bullish, exponential moving averages near the highs. I need some sort of pullback. Is this enough of a pullback? And that's a stall. That's a doji. I need actually to physically see a down candle, preferably down to a support level. And so while I like the long, I mean, it's all I can do. Double green says, all you can do is buy here, Rog but I can't buy at the current level because the second requirement is I need that pullback. So I hope that helps. Uh, SPCE. Okay. Double green as well. Double green as well. Um, you know, very much the same conversation as Amazon where yes, it's a buy. We need a pullback. So what, what would constitute a pullback? Rog, what would those days look like? They would look like uh, this. And it, would pro and it would look like that. Really, this is the 13 exponential, these yellow dots here. So if you were to basically connect the dots, that's where your 13 exponential would be. So it looks like the 13 is very much in play on SPCE. Now, where is SPCE uh, weighted pretty decently? I believe it's pretty well, well weighted in um, ITA. ITA and maybe X XAR. So those are both uh, aerospace and defense. Um, there are a bunch of other ETFs. So make sure you've got about, I would say, no less than 500,000 in terms of volume before you deem that a certain um, ETF is influential over that stock, preferably a million or more. The more volume, clearly the more influence on the stocks that are within that ETF, the holdings. Okay. All right. So... Um, the yen and the dollar are, are strong. The top two, what does that mean for us as day traders? Steven, uh, we could see now, look, the, it's really early. And, and from what I can tell the, the yen is 0 0.07. Last time I checked 0 0.07. Uh, let's see. I'll get, I'll get you. A, yeah. 0 0.09. It's barely down, and the dollar is the strongest currency. So actually, the yen is 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 not as uh, not where I would like it to sit if we were seeing an up day. But it really is a very strong dollar day, uh, relatively speaking. So we're getting another push higher in the greenback, which gold is probably not going to like. We'll see what happens. But here's a euro US which shows that that U.S. dollar strength. It's not a ton of it. It's not like we're getting a brand new low in euro, meaning we're getting brand new highs in the dollar. But the dollar is strong this morning. So probably not a whole heck of a lot. And, and on that question, thank you, Stephen. I'm going to jump on over to the live trading for the final live trading day for the playbook. Uh, super stoked for that. I will see you all in the charts and coffee tomorrow and uh, super trading members. I'll see you all for a dual broadcast in the futures and options room today. We'll take a look at futures. We'll take a look at gold and bonds. We'll take a look at those double green markets and sectors that I've got my eye on. And of course, we'll take your questions and, and set up some trades. So I'll see you for the final hour of the day, then at 3 p.m. All right. So uh, have a great one. I will see you all tomorrow. Be good to each other.